Thank you very much. Um, so I am a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Groningen. Uh, this paper is part of a larger project on structural change and productivity growth funded by DFID. And basically, this would be the outline of the presentation. I will run very quickly through the motivation to do this paper, then some theoretical predictions, although I'm not going to test these predictions. These are just to frame some of the results. I'm going to describe the data and made methods I use, then uh, show you some results, and then finally get to the discussion and conclusions. So the motivation I had for this paper was that I've seen a lot of uh, increasing interest in special economic zones or export processing zones, industrial clusters in sub-Saharan African countries, uh, especially promoted by the World Bank uh, through their country reports. Um, however, when I went back to the literature in search for uh, papers analyzing the actual distribution of employment over space in Africa, I couldn't find much. There is basically some evidence uh, spread around country reports, but nothing really systematic that tells us how employment is actually distributed within countries in sub-Saharan Africa. So the aim of this paper is very simple, but maybe can contribute to filling this gap, is to analyze the special distribution of wage and non-wage employment in a set of sub-Saharan African countries before and after the reforms. Uh, why non-wage and wage uh, employment? This is because non-wage employment has become increasingly more important. And I have reasons, theoretical reasons, to believe that the patterns of distribution of wage and non-wage employment are different. So I want to also contribute by analyzing these two types of employment separately. And then I'm going to try to contrast some of these stylized facts with the predictions that I have from particularly in new economic geography models, to then inform policy about the feasibility uh, of this industrial cluster idea for sub-Saharan African countries. So now for the theoretical predictions, uh, I am going to be talking mostly about new economic geography models, because this is the framework that is used in uh, papers uh, analyzing uh, the possibility of industrial clusters, uh, particularly the 2009 uh, World Development Report, reshaping economic geography is heavily based on new economic geography predictions. So as you may know, uh, in a nutshell, new economic, new economic geography predicts that large, large firms producing on their increasing returns to scale will agglomerate uh, to locate near consumers. And from these larger agglomerations, they will source smaller markets at some transportation cost T. That's a, a very basic uh, outline of the theory, but it's enough for the purpose of uh, the argument that I'm making here. And if you look at sub-Saharan African countries, you have very high transportation costs within uh, countries and a very small scale of production, as evidenced by a very large share of non-wage employment or family business or small scale uh, units, uh, particularly informal units. So when you take these two things together, you say, OK, what is the relevance then of new economic geography theories for sub-Saharan Africa if these are our initial conditions? So what I try to do is to trace back uh, some models that may apply better for the case of sub-Saharan African countries. So first, uh, just to be clear, for new economic geography, for the conditions you have in countries uh, that I just described with high transportation costs and small scale of production, the prediction is just that firms will disperse over space. So you won't have any agglomeration stemming from uh, increasing returns to scale. Um, in particular, for research rich countries, then uh, the prediction is that all the distribution of employment over space is predicted by the uneven distribution of endowments. So be it labor if it's immobile, of, or natural resources. So that is the source of the disparities in the distribution and employment, and not agglomeration economies. So for, particularly for the case of resource-rich African countries, uh, Golding and company have developed a model where they explain why Africa has urbanized without structural change. Um, and this is related to the previous point. So they say that 
these resource-rich countries have uh, agglomerations that are based on consume, consumption of non-tradable. So you basically have the rents from resource activities, and people spend those rents in urban areas. This generates a type of city that they call consumer city that is very different from the city that will uh, be generated by the normal channels of new economic geography. Those are productive cities. So you can think of Chinese cities along the coast as productive cities that are brought about by agglomeration economies from the production side. And you can think, contrast those with uh, African cities where you have large agglomeration, but basically based on the consumption of non-tradable. So the predictions on the benefits of agglomeration are very different from for these two types. So in particular, you would have less benefits for benefits of agglomeration from consumer cities. Um, with a colleague of mine, I also developed a new economic geography model where we try to integrate an informal sector. So the idea is to try to understand what happens uh, when you have a context like the one in sub-Saharan African countries where 80% uh, or more of employment uh, is on small scale activities. And basically in our model we say that people can substitute formal and informal manufacturing varieties. And if, if this substitution is high, the government might improve uh, connectivity, build roads, but that even then there won't be a development of a formal manufacturing sector. Why? Because people still prefer to consume informal goods locally. So that's just to point out how the predictions of energy might change when you introduce some of the particulars for countries like sub-Saharan African countries. And finally, uh, Berens and Polo Bala developed this model also based in a new economic geography model. When you have a set of skilled workers that can either be productive, uh, work in a normal factory, or they can become part of an unproductive urban elite that benefits from rent seeking. So then you have urban agglomerations as well with wage workers, but these wage workers are more unproductive than workers that work at factories. Uh, in that case also you would have uh, lower benefits from agglomeration. So we have basically also the prediction of agglomerations, but with uncertain benefits stemming from them. Not so clear cut as, as the standard case of energy. So now with that on the back of your head, I, I'm, I'm going to try to uh, describe uh, the data and methods I use for the paper that are very simple, but this is a more a comparative uh, exercise, so I'm not trying to add anything to the existing methodology, just to use the available data and some standard methods to inform uh, some of these questions. So I, I use the population census samples that are provided by PUMS uh, for these countries, so Tanzania, 1988-2002, Guinea, 1983-1996, uh, Senegal, 88, 2002, Malawi, 87 and 98, and Mali, 87 and 98. Uh, why this sample? Because these, of all the countries that are listed in IPUMS, are the ones that have at least two year uh, data points for the census and have some of the variables that I need for the analysis. So I basically chose all of the ones that were available. Um, I, had some, I had to do some adjustments to this data to make it comparable. So uh, I used a, a unit of analysis is basically the second level of disaggregation, be it the province, department, or region. I'm not claiming that this, absolutely these areas are comparable because you can think of uh, regions in Malawi that are 10 times larger than some regions in Tanzania. Uh, but they are uh, relatively comparable. So within the country, the, the division is, is fairly the same across. And for uh, changing boundaries, I basically use the oldest boundaries. So I match, whenever there is a changing boundary, I match the, uh, the latest data points to the previous ones. So, so I have a, a uniform set. Uh, then I classified workers using this variable uh, class of workers, 
that is available from IPM US and is supposed to be comparable across time and across countries. And I classify them as wage if this variable takes the value of work at someone else, works for someone else as wage salary worker, and non-wage worker if they are self-employed with or without employees, or they, if they are unpaid workers such as family workers or apprentices. The underlying assumption for this is that basically non-wage employment corresponds to small-scale activities uh, that fall mostly into the production of non-tradable goods and services. So this would be the opposite case of what new economic geography considers to be increasing returns to scale. Wage employment corresponds then is a mix of employment between public and private institutions, but uh, I assume that these are fairly uh, larger in scale regardless. So that's as much as I can do with the available data. I also break down employment by these four industries. They are initially available for 12 industries, but I break it down into agriculture and mining, secondary sector, market services, and non-market services. Unfortunately, this industry uh, variable is not available for these countries in years. So sometimes I cannot make the over time comparison, but I still use all the information I can. These are some general characteristics of the studied countries. So uh, basically, I have a mix here of uh, coastal, non-coastal, resource rich, resource poor, but not large enough to draw any conclusions for these uh, larger categories. So just as a reference, uh, by far the largest is obviously Tanzania. So and then you have the others are fairly similar in size. And well, you can see there some of the other characteristics. So that's just for your reference. So basically, to measure the concentration of employment, I use two types of measures, the uh, uh, spatial measures of concentration and spatial measures of concentration. So I combine these two to give a bigger picture, a more complete picture of what is happening with the distribution of employment in sub-Saharan African countries. So first, the coefficient of variation is very, a very simple measure. It's just the uh, standard deviation over the mean. So for, for the two types of employment, if this measure is zero, that means that there is a uniform distribution. If it increases over time, it means that employment is becoming more concentrated. Uh, why is this indicator spatial? Because it doesn't take into account the proximity or, uh, of, the, um, of the units. So basically, every unit is taken independently and not the fact that they might be proximate. Uh, but I still take it because this is uh, comparable over time and across countries. So that, that is one of the aims I have. And then I, me I measure the degree of concentration using fairly two standard measures, two fairly standard measures of uh, inequality, the tail index and the half the square coefficient of variation derived from the general entropy measures. And here, I won't go through the results, but a larger value indicates more concentration. For the spatial uh, part of the measurement, I have a, a very standard index that is the Global Moran Index. Uh, this index expresses the overall degree of similarity between spatially close regions, so what is called spatial autocorrelation. Uh, with respect to a numerical variable that in my case it can be wage or non-wage employment. So the spatial interaction is measured through an inverse distance matrix uh, and then I, I measure the distance in a very standard way which is the bilateral distance measured as the crowd flies. Uh, and this global modern can take basically a positive value in which case uh, it is indicating that proximate regions exhibit similar values. So that's, uh, that would be indicating uh, clustering. Um, if it's negative, it uh, indicates that proximate regions exhibit dissimilar values of employment. And if it is statistically significant, it means that the distribution of employment does not follow any particular pattern over space. So the distribution can be taken as to be as random. And uh, an extension of this global moran is the local indicator of spatial association, which is go basically going to tell us where this clustering happens. 
So it identifies where clusters happen, the center of the cluster. Uh, a cluster would be then a region that has high employment and is surrounded by regions that also have high employment. You can also have also something called cold spot, which is a region with low employment surrounded by regions of low employment. So now for the interesting part of the presentation, the results. Uh, first, I'm going to go through the coefficient of variation. Uh, up there, you can see the coefficient of variation on the same scale uh, for the five countries here. So you can compare the absolute values across. And on this axis, I have the share of wage employment in total employment. So the first thing you notice is that for most of these countries, the share of wage employment decreased sharply. But this is a stylized fact that is already well known in the literature. Except for Senegal, when you see it stay, staying at a level of around 15%. So very sharp decrease in countries like Guinea. Mali never really had much of wage employment anyway. But you see that even though this share is decreasing, employment is becoming more concentrated. So you see it here, the change over time wage employment becoming less representative and more concentrated. This is the finding that I have. Then non-wage employment, as you can compare here the red with the blue, non-wage employment is far less concentrated than wage employment. So that's one of the main results here, that the two types of employment have very different patterns of concentration. And you see it clearly there. For the case of Guinea, it's very extreme, uh, the difference in concentration levels of these two types of employment. And you see that there is not really much of a change over time. So this, we're talking about 10 years difference at least. But it seems like nothing really happened with the concentration of non-wage employment, as this is expected. Because non-wage employment, if you remember, is related to small scale activities that disperse in space. So there is no reason why this type of employment would become concentrated. So this makes a lot of sense uh, in that sense. Uh, so you have different cases, like in Tanzania, it actually became more dispersed over time. You have some other countries where it remained fairly stable. And in Senegal and Guinea, it increased, but it was initially at very low levels. So, uh, For the industries, I'm not going to show the table with the results, but I'm going to just run through the main results. So uh, these indexes of LG1 and G2 are very close to their lower bound. Uh, meaning that absolutely industries in Africa have very low levels of concentration to start with. The highest level of concentration comparatively between the four sectors that I have is on market services, as this is expected. So for instance, retail services, uh, retail trade, sorry. And they are lowest in agricultural and mining. This is also to be expected because of the nature of, the, of agricultural activities. And this remained true before and after structural reform. So another uh, finding is that basically not much happened between before and after reforms with the spatial distribution of employment in the countries that I analyzed. Uh, Non-wage employment is absolutely less concentrated than wage employment um, in these three sectors, so in all sectors except non-market. For the two countries where I can analyze patterns over time, I find that basically there is not much of a change because of two reasons. Why? Because there is no movement of employment towards sectors that display larger concentration. So not much change, for instance, from agriculture to market services in that time period. And there is an increasing share of dispersed non-wage employment. So those are the sources of the lack of change. Now for the spatial part, here the ones that are shaded are not significant at the 95% level. And here, then I wouldn't take them into account because already I have a very small number of observations. So it's fair, fair to say that these values are not to be interpreted. But for the ones that I uh, can interpret, then I see that uh, there is no spatial autocorrelation in wage employments for all countries except for Senegal, which is also, you can see here, uh, this is wage. Uh, levels of spatial autocorrelation are positive, meaning that there is some global pattern of autocorrelation, but it's not very strong. 
and it's only significant for the country that, if you remember, had some significant share of wage employment in, the bo in both periods. So it's not surprising that I don't find anything for wage for the other countries because it represented such a small share of employment anyway. And then you observe here that the patterns for uh, non-wage employment are also relatively small. Now, uh, where these clusters are located? You have here, for wage employment, I do not find any significant local indicator special association. For the case of non-wage, I find some here in the area around Lake Victoria. But if you can see here, comparing over time, there is a high inertia uh, in this. So the distribution remains fairly the same across. And then for the only case where I find a clear wage employment cluster is for Senegal around the Dakar area. So this is the only country of the five that I analyzed where you can see some evidence of clustering for wage employment. And the interesting part is that there is also clustering of non-wage employment but happening not in the same areas as the other one. So for the conclusions, very quickly, um, so I'll just go through all of them. Um, so basically, uh, there is not much happening in wage employment, but it is the type of employment that, as you saw, has a different, uh, different spatial patterns and is the one that is relevant for industrial clusters. So all these ideas of uh, creating uh, uh, clusters seems at odd with this evidence. Um, it seems that most of the distribution in space in sub-Saharan African countries is explained by the distribution of resources, like it was very clear in the case of Tanzania. And new urban settlements are dispersed in the interior area, so the migration is within the same region. So there is not much of movement uh, to the coast or anything like that, like we are observing in China. And then uh, basically the relationship between structural change in space and structural change in industries, you can see clearly the connection. Because there has not been change by industries, you don't also observe any change in space. So as long as you don't change the distribution in wage and non-wage employment and the distribution across industries, this clustering in coastal areas is not going to happen. So my prediction would be that, for, at least for the case of Tanzania, this idea of, uh, of uh, uh, export processing zones and clusters and the area of Dar es Salaam does not much make much sense. Thank you and sorry. <laughs>